I wanna be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. You're listening to the Producers Perspective Podcast with your host, Tony Award winner, Ken Davenport. Hey everybody, it's Ken Davenport. We've got Rachel Chavkin, director Rachel Chavkin on the podcast today. And she's going to talk about all sorts of things from Natasha Pierre and why she doesn't like to give advice. But we may have squeezed that a little bit anyway. But before we get to that podcast, I want to give a big shout out to this week's sponsor, Daniel Rader Photo is our podcast sponsor this week. He's an award-winning theater photographer whose work has been featured in newspapers, magazines, online publications, including the New York Times, never heard of it, Hollywood Reporter, Playbill, PBS, and lots more. He can do theater photography for your show, headshots. If you are a performer or a producer or any kind of artist, everyone needs a good shot on their website these days. Based here in New York City, but can travel. Has passport, can travel. You can get in touch with Daniel at danielraderphoto.com. That's D-A-N-I-E-L-R-A-D-E-R, photo.com. Check it out. He's done some great work for us, and I know he can do some great work for you. Now, let's get to Rachel. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Producers Perspective podcast. I am Ken Davenport. I'm very excited to have on the podcast today. We've been trying to schedule this sucker for months, but she's so in demand. She's been (laughs) flying all over the world. Uh, One of the most talked about directors on the Broadway scene today, and one of the most sought after. Please welcome the Tony-nominated director, Rachel Chavkin. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks, Ken. So Rachel burst onto the scene with her incredibly unique production of Natasha Pierre and the Comet of 1812, uh, which received the highest number of Tony nominations for any musical that season. She's directed at Lincoln Center, Williamstown, and many, many others. Uh, she's the director of the Broadway-bound Town, which just got rave reviews in London, and while has not been announced yet, has been rumored to be coming in this spring. We'll see if we can uh, <laughs> get her to spill. Oh, good. Um, so, Rachel, I, I started that introduction with, like, Rachel, burst onto the scene. <laughs> I'm like, well, I was 32, so I've been exactly. doing things prior to that point. I had a feeling you would yeah. disagree with this sure. burst out to yeah, the yeah, scene. Yeah. So tell me how it got started for you really. Um, uh, I guess, I guess, uh, I mean, there's like so many different places you could like be a zygote, but, um, I would say like work really got going after I graduated college. Uh, while I was in college, I'd begun making my own work and had been very, very drawn to experimental work and in particular the work of experimental ensembles. So like the Wooster Group Elevator Repair Service. Um, Need Company, which is a Belgian company whose work I encountered through BAM and um, uh, the the downtown scene. And so after leaving college, um, I was working for a few years as assistant director uh, and teaching and Barnes and Nobling and all the all the things. Um, but uh, in 2004, I be I heard about the Edinburgh Fringe Festival which I'd never been to before, but a playwright who I was working with wanted to bring a show that we were making to Edinburgh. And this show had like 15 people in it. And very quickly, like I began learning about the festival and how it worked. And I was like, that is not going to happen for this show. But it made me want to make two shows that I had already been thinking about uh, with some artist friends who I'd been collaborating with since college. And we got together and we ended up calling ourselves the team for the Fringe brochure because we like needed an ensemble name. And and that was the founding of, of a company that I'm one of the founding members of. I'm the artistic director of and is still operating today. And so the team kind of had its coming out at the 2005 Edinburgh Fringe Festival. We ended up winning the Fringe first in the first week of the festival out of like, you know, it's, I think it was like 3,000 something shows at that point. Not all of which are eligible for that award. It's a premier award, but we did very well at the festival, which then led to like an invitation to come back to the Traverse the following year, which then led to a little company called the National Theater of Scotland that was just premiering. And John Tiffany, who was like this, you know, exploding director. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he was like just at beginning to explode at that time. It was the year they did Black Watch and we were doing a show and, and he saw it, which led to a first major commission. And so, like, every – it's why I work, actually, so much in the United Kingdom is because of all my ties through the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Um, and that was really the start of my 
working life. Um, New York came much later and my freelance career came much later apart from apart from my existence with the team. So tell me about this. I was already starting to make my own work. Like, where did you get that impetus to do that? Why not just sit back and, oh, someone wants to do the cherry orchard. Or sure. Someone wants to do anything goes. Sure. I know. It would be so much easier. <laughs> um, it wouldn't necessarily be so much easier. You can work really hard at that stuff, obviously. And I do now. Um, I don't know. I guess a couple things. One, I saw my first Wooster Group show, House Lights, when I was 18. I would think like a month into college. And I was like, what the... Can I swear on this? Swear what all the way. Fuck? I love when you get the explicit yeah. rating on iTunes. It's my favorite. I was just like, what the fuck is this? And I couldn't get enough of it. And I didn't know what they were doing. And... Um, so, so I, so already I became interested in artists who are not only creating original work and original content, but we're doing it in pretty weird ways by like mainstream play standards. And then in my second year at school, I took a class called Cow, Creating Original Work. And it was taught by, um, a really far out, brilliant experimental choreographer and dancer named Marlene Pennison. And the class happened on Sunday nights from 7 to 10 p.m. You did not get graded. You did not get marked down. Obviously, if you did or did not show up, there was like no attendance. You had, like the rule was you were to bring snacks of some kind. Um, and the only assignment was to be interesting alone on stage for 10 minutes. And it was a semester long course. And what I had, Marlene would say some of this, but most of this came in retrospect because she was actually pretty cryptic. But what became really clear is like, Marlene actually at the end of the day could not have cared less what you made. What she was interested in was putting you into the crisis of your own process. And so some people would not show the entire semester and then show up on the final showing day with like a fucking genius 10 minute piece and other people would not show the entire semester and show up at the end and it would be like a shit show and some people would bring in an entirely new 10 minute piece every single week and they would just like pick it up and put it off like clothing and what I learned I had to do for myself was um to slowly chip away at it and specifically to give myself homework assignments because I'd always been uh, a good student. And so I began giving myself writing prompts and improvisation prompts or whatever to in, in the face of which I could then generate material because otherwise I was just in a vacuum. Um, so that was how I began making my own work. And then the following year, and you could do cow as many times as you wanted. <laughs> like you, you just, you just, you know, kept being with yourself. As long as you have basically. snacks, as long as you have snacks. snacks, Oreos, big, popular. Um, and then the the next year, I had to do an hour long directing project as part of the curriculum. And there were, I was just also, I mean, you know, as like a twenty year old, I was really ornery and really. Um, into counterculture. <laughs> I mean, just like that. My grew up loving punk music, and I just like I, I just was like, there's no plays that I want to do. There's no good hour long plays, which is obviously bullshit. I know that now, but at that time, that was where I was coming from. And so, me and my friend Jake Margolin decided to adapt Allen Ginsberg's poem Howl for the stage. And so that was the first time that I was working on another group of performers uh, and that was four men and one woman and I literally like sat with scissors and tape and Xeroxed Howl and uh, On the Road and um, Norman Mailer's essay The White Negro and then all of this writing about bebop jazz and what in particular these white poets were trying to emulate, appropriate and fetishize and worship about what these black musicians were doing in music in the 50s. Um, so that was the first piece I made. And like those are, that's the DNA of the team. So when you were taking Cow, yes. were you classifying yourself as a director, writer, actor? Did you know what you wanted to do? No, I didn't think too much. I mean, for Cow, you did everything because you were performing, you were writing, and you were, you didn't have a director. Like you had to do it by yourself. That was, I think, one of the rules. Actually, I'm not even sure that was a rule. Um, 
But I did go, I went to NYU and, and specifically within NYU, I went to the Playwrights Horizon Theater School for the majority of my time. I did the classical studio senior year. Uh, and um, I definitely chose NYU and playwrights because I was interested in both acting and directing. So I definitely like did use those two words anyway, but in Cal it was very amorphous, which I loved. So do you think, this is one of those big what ifs. Sure. You, you've taken a very non-traditional approach or this creating your own work in order to the, for your path to success on Broadway mm-hmm. and for many years to come, I'm sure. Do you think it's happened quicker because you've created your own original work as opposed to going the assistant route and doing that for many years and going the more traditional route? I wouldn't know. I mean, I don't I don't think there... I was not the youngest person to ever make their Broadway debut, I think by a long shot. I don't actually know who that person was or how old they were. But I am no, it's, I know that there were no stories about me making, being the youngest person ever. I was 32. I was a, uh, oh no. By the time I made my Broadway debut, I was 30. Let's see, we opened in 2016. So I was, thir- I was 36. So that's well in the pocket of a mid career artist. Would you um, encourage younger artists, if they had a choice of creating original work that they could direct? Who knows where it will be? Maybe yeah. it will be Broadway, maybe not. Yeah. Or, going after the more traditional route and directing Shakespeare and I don't know if that's musicals. any more traditional. I mean, I guess I would say two things. One is I try not to ever give advice explicitly because because I think it's very presumptuous that there's something about my experience that is relevant to your experience. Um, uh, that said, I when I taught, um, I would say the task is to direct and so if you're not directing for prolonged stretches it might be hard to call yourself a director now there's a lot of different aspects of work that make up a director's life so when I say if you're not directing that doesn't necessarily mean rehearsing in a room that could be prepping or sit you know you know sitting with scissors and scotch tape and like piecing together the script that one day you're visualizing and you're going to do vis- you know research for and um, go to the picture collection at the public library and you know pull images for all of that is the work of directing but but fundamentally that's the only distinction between if you're a director or not so I certainly would say always be making your own work but you can do that alongside assisting in formal you know paid capacities as well because you have to eat Tell me about the origins of Natasha Pierre. How did that start for you? Yeah, so Comet was Dave's and my third show together, I think. Um, we So I met Dave through the downtown experimental scene. Dave is a part of a company called Banana Bag and Bodice with amazing artists Jason Craig and Jessica Jellif. And uh, I had seen this show that they made together called Beowulf, A Thousand Years of Baggage which I loved and I saw it like 50 times and I'm, I mean, actually don't think I'm exaggerating because I've I've been on the I've toured with it they were in Edinburgh when we were in Edinburgh so I've seen it many 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 times I really love this show um, and in 2009 I was working with a playwright actually the same one who years before had brought up the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and she was now at Vassar College um, which definitely goes to like that lesson of you just have no idea where people are going to end up being. Um, so she was on visiting faculty at Vassar College, and she and as part of that, they were going to do a play of hers. And that was, I think, one of my first paid gigs outside of the team. Uh, it was one of my first freelance gigs, and she wanted to make this play into a musical. And did I know any composers? And so I called Dave, basically cold calling, was like do you want to come up to Vassar and do a show with me? And we ended up living together in Poughkeepsie and just getting to know each other over a month working with the students. And it was wonderful because it was very low. I mean, obviously, we took seriously our responsibility to the students, but it was like totally low stakes in terms of what artistically needed to emerge. Do you remember why he said yes? He had just moved to the city and he had no money. (laughs) 
So it was a job, you know, it was a job. Um, and we had liked each other. I mean, like we had enjoyed each other's presence at parties. Um, but he had just moved and he, and he didn't have any work for the fall. (laughs) So, you know, so then we were, we were like strolling across the green one day and like talking about dream projects. And he said, there's this sliver of, have you read War and Peace? There's this sliver. And, and we got to talking about it. And then we did another show, Three Pianos together. And, and so by the time Ars Nova commissioned Dave as their artist in residence, composer in residence, uh, we had this deep collaboration. And that was how. Did you ever imagine that it would end up on a Broadway stage? Did you think, oh, this this could go all the way someday? Um, no, because I don't think of Broadway as all the way. I love, you know, I I love Broadway. I grew up getting taken to Broadway, but I I think because because of my work in the experimental sphere, because and and through that getting to do a bunch of international travel and so like seeing shows at the national and seeing shows at the hong kong arts festival and in holland at this incredible arts festival that i was there for in 2000 like those are all destinations so broadway is a specific destination and certainly it's a destination where you can really make a living which is remarkable um, both, uh, you know, for myself as a, uh, individual artist, but also it's so amazing to work in an environment where I'm not worried about whether my company, either the on stage or off stage has health insurance, can afford a babysitter. Um, those are, those are major quality of life things that, um, you know, are so often neglected. And so it's wonderful to be in a, in, in a environment that, I'm not worried about that. What was the um, biggest surprise you had when you got there? Having had this experience, yeah. <clears throat> having had this experience all over the world, yeah. these amazing experiences, yeah. then you're like, oh my gosh, this show's going to come to Broadway. Isn't this great and exciting? Yes. What was the biggest surprise to you when you got there? Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. This is different than these other incredible places. Oh, that's funny. I, uh, the first thing I was going to say is the, the major surprise was actually that, oh, tech is tech. Which actually was, I was surprised that it was the same. You know, it was bigger. There were, I couldn't um, reorient. I drove my both stage manager and our incredible wardrobe team like incredibly crazy because A, we didn't have an, enough tech time, but B, I, uh, my brain is always trying to move for maximum efficiency. And so if it makes sense for us to like tech a scene for a, a given moment, I just like, got schooled in terms of how quickly a costume change can happen for like the whole building. Also, we had 30 people on stage. So, so, so that was a surprise, but, but, or a learning experience, but ultimately like that, that tech is tech was actually surprising and encouraging. Um, and then I don't know, there are many things about Paloma uh, Garcia Lee, one of our incredible ensemble members and our dance captain, she dubbed she dubbed Comet. She, <laughs> we had this long running joke where me and Sam Pingleton, our choreographer, would turn to Paloma and say, "Well, what would they do on regular Broadway?" <laughs> and, and that was a term that she'd come up with. She would say, "Well, on regular Broadway, they would do this." And then one day, I think I asked, "What are, what are we?" And she she very kindly said, "This is extraordinary Broadway." Um, what did she mean? Well, from a choreographic perspective, um, Comet had twenty entirely unique ensemble tracks, which our swings had to cover, um, and the ensemble tracks were built very, very deliberately to celebrate. Um, the body shape and the body moves that felt good for each individual performer because one of the missions of that show was to create a space that is as um, divergent and um, multi-hyphenate as um, 
uh, as the world that Tolstoy was writing about. I mean, it's, it's, it was both dramaturgically related and very political for Dave and Sam and I and the whole company. Um, uh, was the celebration of race and class and queerness and, uh, uh, and all of those different uh, people coming together. I mean, it was part of the audience design as well. It was Mimi's big uh, um, raisin d'etre was, was that everyone be in the same room together and be able to see each other. So the audience on stage, the entire room enveloped with this red velvet curtain, that kind of community coming together with shakers and dumplings to like receive this story and, and feed into this story um, uh, that was very hand built. And as a result, it was, um, extraordinary Broadway, I think meant like it was very anti, um, uh, factory line, Mm -hmm. right? Like it's, it's in fact, rejecting the point of why numbers go across a Broadway stage um, and a court why you have a chorus line Um, and and that made it sort of a you know I said to the audience uh, not to the audience I said to the cast and uh, on the closing show in our like pre-show pep talk um, you know there was nothing Comet was not not ever built to be sustainable and it got very Large in ways that were not necessarily my intention, but like, but fundamentally, I think the spirit of the show was that it felt like a, uh, the, the band playing as the Titanic sinks. And that is a level of like exertion and exhaustion. Um, that is, yeah, I think all those things made it. What do you think of the phrase immersive theater? What do I think of it? Yeah, do you? It's if got someone several syllables. Um, That's true. It's... Okay, next question. Yeah. <laughs> do you like it when people say, "Oh, Natasha Pierre was like immersive theater"? Yeah, I mean it's fine. <laughs> it seems to help people know a bit what to expect. Do you think of it that way? I don't think of it as participatory theater in any way. I don't think of it as. I mean. I guess what I would be concerned about with that label for the production is I think people, I never wanted people to be afraid. We talked a lot about good touch, bad touch uh, with the cast is like what, and I think, and that's both a literal thing of like touching and also a spiritual thing of uh, the mode in which eye contact is delivered. it, and I think it has everything to do with not being desperate. Is be, If you are secure in yourself, you can sort of meet anyone's eyes generously. And if they are secure in themselves, they will look back at you. And if not, you lose nothing if they look away. And so you don't have to grab them by the chin and be like, look at me. You know, so it's, it's like being confident in your own fiction or your own reality is maybe a better way of saying that. Um, That said, I don't know. I guess I don't think of, I don't, I never thought of the integrity of performance of the acting in Comet any differently than I do with Hades Town, for example. And Hades Town is now a proscenium. I mean, it's in the Olivier, so it's it's a bit of a thrust, but but for all intents and purposes, it's an end on show. And I hope it feels as immersive, like feels as overwhelming. You know, as I said, I like, I can remember going to, um, uh, you know, clubs in DC for music. And I, w- and I want, I uh, would be, and still, though I don't get to go to music nearly as much anymore, but like, I want to feel it in my bones. And I think I seek the same experience in theater. And do you think our generation, we're close enough in it, we're about mm. a decade apart, but do you think that's what our generation's theater going will be in 10 years like everyone wanting to be inside it will it be different than our parents theater or great uh-huh. parents theater um probably i think that's true uh you know i don't know it's hard because like if you read any if you read the writings of like any young artist or any intense artists like you read a manifesto 
And a man, I mean, that's, that's a self-selecting group because the people who are driven to write a manifesto are seeking something. They're like seeking to mainline something. Uh, and that's, I could go back to a manifesto from the late 19th century and we would feel like someone who's like bashing their head into a wall. But like, you know, thinking about Ulu Wah or, uh, so, uh, but that said, I mean, the definitely like, the move towards VR, the move towards the personal entertainment system, I'm making a gesture of an iPhone that I'm holding in front of my face, that is a very, like you are mainlining that directly into your central nervous system. So it certainly makes sense to me that people will seek that same vividness on stages. So Natasha Pierre, Hades Town. We were just talking about you involved with Olympica. Yes. Obviously, you're attracted to shows with very interesting titles. But sure. what else about a show makes you say, "Oh, this I want to. I want to do this one." Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's so um, about half of or three quarters of what I'm doing is just like from people who now I know. So first and foremost, what makes me want to do something is someone I love is a part of it. Um, like Bess Wall, pretty much. I just actually, a schedule didn't work out for a show with her playwright, but like anytime she called me, I would be there. Um, We're a big fan of Bess here. Yeah. She did a podcast for us. She's oh, terrific. So good. Um, and obviously, so many other folks are the same. Um, uh, so that's number one. Number two is if there's historical elements. I love history. Uh, if there's political elements. If the piece is a good vehicle for politics, which is not necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean that there's overt politics as part of it, but, uh, and politics for me infiltrates everything. So it's, it's the, um, diversity and I, I mean that specifically racial diversity, though also cultural diversity, age diversity of the creative team, of the cast, um, it's uh, the sometimes it'll be the poetry of the language, I, uh, and if if I can feel the language like needing to be articulated in space, um, plays or musicals. What do you prefer? Don't have a preference. Plays are harder. Why? I find um, uh, plays don't specify time. And so, like, working on Carol Churchill's Light Shining in Buckinghamshire was one of my favorite, favorite experiences of my artistic existence. And Carol's, I mean, the text is actually quite, quite compressed on the page, but me and the actors would be working through it, and it's like, I think something happened between that sentence and that sentence, but there's no stage direction, and there's not even a paragraph break necessarily. So you have to figure out actually whether there's, okay, if we take like 30 seconds of stillness while you drool a bit, performer X, and then, you know, regain your senses and then go on to the next line, does that make this moment, does that make the next line have as much integrity as possible? And that's ultimately all we can use. And, and by that, I, you could mean emotional truth or... Uh, however you want to put it but like do you mean the words that you are saying um, so so plays don't specify that navigation necessarily in a way that musicals do because there's a you know even if it's not set to click there's basically a you know the rhythm that the that the composer has specified So musicals are more logistically challenging it's like driving obviously you know uh, a fleet of cars versus like a single sedan that you're all packed into the back of. But you mentioned diversity. There's been a lot of talk about the lack of gender diversity, certainly in the captain of the ship role mm-hmm. of being a director on a Broadway production. Uh, have you felt that struggle? Did you feel that struggle when you were on your way? Do you feel it now? Um. Yeah, so what would I say? So, yes, there's a huge lack of parity. Um, I think the way 
it mostly plays out from at least my experience is I just don't know what plays I'm not getting offered. And I mean plays, musicals. I just don't know what jobs I'm not getting because you just don't get necessarily called into that room. And I, the thing that I would say I clock again and again is um, young genius boy. And I think he, in my experience, for the most part, is always special. I mean, I taught you know, for 13 years at NYU. And I can name so many young genius men who do something and you just like push them and elevate them and they rise very, very rapidly in a way that um, would take a, seems to take a woman of equivalent age at that time. You have to do like five shows very well before you get that Broadway production. So I think that's a major difference is the rate at which you move from directing an indie to directing a blockbuster in Hollywood language. I think um, uh, the other big, big way it, it differentiates and I became, I, and this is something I process all the time still, uh, and I became particularly aware of it when Dave Malloy and I started having a bunch of meetings together after Comet. And it was amazing to watch Dave have a meeting. So he, I was like, oh my God, he's so clear about what he wants. Uh, and uh, he knows the pitch and et cetera. And I don't. And I don't, I, you know, and, and so that sent me into a long and again, ongoing process of going, well, is that because women aren't taught to say what we want at very young ages that it would seem impolite? Um, is that because women's thinking is less linear um, and more mysterious? I mean, we can begin to spiral off into all sorts of um, uh, gender stereotypes slash maybe real neurology and the, the space between those things is actually it's so blurry right now uh, and it's also so binary in ways that I'm not particularly interested in thinking um, uh, but but yeah I think about that a lot it's just like tra training your brain to have a meeting uh, which I felt like I didn't ever quite learn and maybe so <laughs> nailed <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, are you better at it today, do you think? I'm probably a bit better. But also, sometimes now, I feel uninterested in being better at it. Like, I want to be on my terms, right? So this is the other flip side of it is women maybe are getting to enough of a place where it's like, well, what if I don't want to wear my power like a man? What if I want to wear my power like a fucking woman? And so does that mean that we're going to have more circular conversations and does our process have to be set up for exactly this and also what's a climax of a play and what if I'm much more interested in Gertrude Stein than Aristotle so you know then we can begin to really but that's a deep one right there well it's all you I forget mean, Aristotle was a man like, of course he was I don't <laughs> you might I but would. I don't but that's yeah. part of the challenge right mm-hmm Right, is what we value, is very determined based on uh, the dominant culture and power structures. And that, of course, goes to white supremacy as well, and what is beautiful, and what is funny, and what is, um, what is a good joke, and what is high art, and all of that is, is really, are really deep questions. We'll just let that one sit there sure. for a second so our <laughs> listeners may ponder it. Uh, What's your rehearsal room like? It's funny. It's, it's funny, jokes. really. Yeah, yeah. Oh, with all this, you're you're obviously a very smart woman, very intellectual. You think about things. I can I can see your brain turning, and you have a it's a circus in there. Um, I guess I would say a few things. Uh, I mean, uh, other people would obviously be able to answer better because you sort of, as a director, you you. I mean, and particularly, I assisted very rarely, so. I don't know much how other people's rooms are. I know we laugh a lot. I know that I'm a um, very uh, 
rigorous, like I'll just keep going over and over and over something and changing and changing. Like I'll keep refining until they basically pry the play from my gold dead hands. Um, so there's that. And then I try to assume that everyone is as smart as I am, but it's going to be bringing a different kind of expertise, um, to the, to the work. And if I have cast the show well and assembled the creative team well, then, then everyone is really empowered to bring what their expertise is. And it's got to be different than my expertise. Um, so, which is all to say it's a pretty collaborative room, but I find that to be like a, a meaningless thing to say. Um, cause everyone would say so. Oh, not everyone. Some people would probably say they run a dictatorship, which is cool too. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, and I guess the last thing I would say is in terms of the circus comment is I do, I do really believe that actors take a long time to organize all the different things that they are coordinating, including where they're breathing, what lines they're saying, what note they're supposed to be singing, much less how they are interested in inflecting that note on a vocal technique level, much less what they mean to the other person or want from the other person that they are making eye contact with, much less whether they want to cross and step first on their right foot versus their left foot so like all of those and I haven't even gone through half of it much less like what costume they're wearing and whether their pants are too tight and is the light in their eyes so like all of these things are so much information that I think an actor is synthesizing and thus I feel very comfortable living for a while in mess and chaos while the actor brings some of that information into focus and often I'll like nudge in different directions to try to steer a ship in a way that I'm interested in going I will absolutely be like you know abort mission if it's moving in a way that I'm not interested in but um but I am very okay with living with chaos for long periods of time because I know the second we hit tech I'm gonna say you have to stand 16 inches to the left because that's where I want to put the light you know so we can so so I'll get my say at a certain point knowing that actors do take a long time to negotiate all those different mm -hmm. things what do you look for in an audition what makes you go oh yeah this this person can do it even though it may be messy right now whether they have the spirit of the character I mean I don't see bad actors anymore you know like uh I, with the level of, and I haven't for years and years at the level that I'm auditioning, is I'm seeing professionals who have been, even if they're young, even if they're quite, quite early career, uh, something has happened to like get them into that room by the, by the casting director. So, so then my, the only thing I care about is whether they are in step with what that character requires and that's going to be different so there's not like a universal answer to that question because because it'll depend entirely on the vibe of the show and the tone of the role and and how we're approaching it okay my last question which is my genie question genie question yes okay. i want you to imagine the genie from aladdin comes uh -oh. to visit you i like that movie when <laughs> Also musical. Yes, I've seen it. Uh, Dave and I went and saw it, did a double header of that in Lion King. Oh, uh, I want to hear what time. you think after. Uh, so, and the genie grants you one wish. What's the thing that drives you crazy about Broadway or the theater in general that actually would make you bang your head against the wall, that would get you so upset that you'd ask this genie to wish away in an instant? Oh. Uh. I am going to flip it to a positive, which is because I was just at the National for two months doing uh, Hades Town there. Um, and it was pro one of the happiest working experiences, maybe the happiest working experience of my life in term, on so many different fronts, like coming together to, to mean that. Um, and there are two things that the National had that I thought were awesome, which I would genie wish on every 
on like the Broadway community and then uh, every nonprofit institution in the country. Uh, and they're both on the second floor. There was a canteen that was open all day um, where every staff member, a crew member, an artist working in that building could get a hot and nutritious meal for four pounds and, uh, or a wrap of like cold prepared food for like two pounds. That was extraordinary. And right next door to the canteen was a staff bar where you could bring guests after the show and or pre-show but um but it was it was for the staff and beers and wine and booze was cheap and i found those two things quite remarkable and made for a quality of life i remember a friend was talking about london and i was like do you want to ever run a theater there and he was like no you don't make enough money and I and we were talking about it, and he met. He's very affectionate to it, but he was like, "Well, no one gets rich there, but also no one, you know, is uh, at sea there in a way that I just think you can be really at sea here because our government is so c- cruel, um, and this country is so cruel in terms of social." justice and social safety net programs so so that canteen and that bar were both awesome they're good food and fun drinks but also they were symbols of uh, a, a community that wants to hang out with you a building that was built by a government that cares about art I would genie wish those what a great idea and it's so funny because this country is not very good at that sort of thing except every major corporation We'll have a commissary yeah. or a cafeteria yeah. for the same exact reasons yeah. that the national does. Yeah. Fantastic idea. Thank you so much for that idea. Thank you for sure. uh, joining us here today. Good luck with everything. I want to say also, though, and maybe people can like DM me on Twitter or something, but Nate Koch, producer Nate Koch and I really want to create a, 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 a daycare co-op also for both the Broadway community and downtown community. So that's a genie wish. That's as, like a slipped in genie wish. As the dad genie-wish. of an eight month old, I'm yeah. showing her a photo right now. Uh, I'm into that. Yeah. So maybe we can yeah. chat about it. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks to all of you for listening. We will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>